Let's continue. But things get even more complicated, and we see another example of the depth of Cervantes' narrative agility. In the fighting at the second inn over Maritornes, Cervantes anticipated slapstick, cartoonish antics. Now, he gives us something more like the intense melodrama of a soap opera. Back in his hometown, Cardenio visits Lucinda. Later, he raves to such a degree about the beauty, grace, and discretion of his beloved that his friend Fernando wants to see her in person. Cardenio fulfills his wish, showing her to him one night by the light of a candle at a window where we used to talk. He saw her in a nightgown, such that she made him forget about all the beauties he had ever seen before. What the hell was Cardenio thinking? It's not that difficult to imagine. The sequence is a case of extreme bonding between two male characters who together enjoy the discovery of the female body. Cardenio recognizes his error, admitting that from that moment on, Fernando spoke only of Lucinda, which aroused in me a certain degree of jealousy. Jealousy again. At this key moment, everything goes south when Cardenio mentions that one day Lucinda asked him for a book of chivalry to read, of which she was very fond, which was Amadis of Gaul. Now Cardenio and Lucinda are like Paolo and Francesca in Book 5 of Dante's Inferno. Don Quixote's reaction is hilarious as he rushes to praise Lucinda. If your grace had told me early in this story that her grace the lady Lucinda was fond of books of chivalry, no other exaggeration would have been necessary for me to understand the height of her understanding. From just having grasped her leisurely interest I can confirm her to be the most beautiful and discreet woman in the world. By the way, here's one of history's most important indications of the important role played by upper class women as avid consumers of the fantasy literature of the 16th century. Don Quixote proceeds to recommend that Cardenio send Lucinda Don Rugel of Greece, one of the continuations of Amadis of Gaul written by none other than Feliciano de Silva. Remember the author mentioned in chapter one when Cervantes parodied his style of writing, the reason of unreason which has overtaken my reason? This is all hilarious, but also ominous and on many levels. As per the allusion to Dante, hell is upon us. Not only has Don Quixote interrupted Cardenio's narrative, doing precisely what he had asked him not to do, but just as Fernando, Don Quixote has expressed his highest estimation of the beauty of Lucinda, which causes Cardenio to be jealous. And wait a second, has Don Quixote forgotten entirely about Dulcinea? Cardenio is lost in deep thought, but eventually he lets fly with a comment about two characters in Amadis of Gaul a comment which cuts directly to the essence of his madness. Cardenio alleges that there was an illicit love affair between a certain queen and a certain priest surgeon. Recall the professions of Don Quixote's best friends. That great villain, master surgeon Elisabat, was cohabiting with Queen Madesima. Don Quixote roundly objects, that is false by God, and he insists the Queen Madesima was an eminent lady, and there is no reason to believe that such a high-born princess would cohabitate with a quack cyst popper, and anyone who thinks otherwise is a base and lying scoundrel. Curiously, the narrator seems more interested in Don Quixote's madness than in Cardenio's. He tells us that Don Quixote rushes to the defense of Queen Madasima as if she were Dulcinea. What a strange case! for he shielded her as if she were his true and natural queen. Do you believe idle reader in the subconscious? It sure seems like Cervantes did. The physical confrontation that now occurs has to remind us of the fight over Maritornes. Don Quixote, Sancho, and the old goat herd are left thrashed and beaten, and Cardenio disappears, returning to his unknown refuge in the mountains. We then read another comical scene that anticipates so many from the Three Stooges. Sancho blames the goat herd, accusing him of not having warned them of the man's madness. The goat herd replied that he had indeed told him and that if he did not hear him, it was not his fault. 
Sancho responded and the goat herd responded back and all this responding ended in beards being pulled and such an exchange of blows that if Don Quixote had not imposed peace, they would have smashed each other to pieces. Notice that Cardenio has the same confused obsession with romances of chivalry that Don Quixote does. Maybe that's why Don Quixote is so saddened and observes, I know he is not to blame for what happened. But wait, clearly Cardenio now suffers from some psychological disorder, but is the question of his guilt so simple? Is Cardenio really as innocent and noble as he claims to be? Remember that once he became aware of the Duke's request that he befriend his eldest son, Cardenio hesitated to follow through on his request to marry Mustinda. To sum up, here again, the novel is characterized by extreme narrative breaks and traumatic storytelling. Although this time we observe what are perhaps clearer anticipations of what today we would call psychoanalytic theory. Cervantes even seems to parody psychoanalytic theory avant la lettre. Individual cases of desire lead to jealousy, and the eventual outcome is another case of madness, and then an outbreak of violence among men as diverse as an Andalusian nobleman, an old goat herd, and Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. And all this chaos, both psychological and physical, takes place in the Sierra Morena, not far from one of the main cities of Andalusia, famous for its horses. In all likelihood, this city is Cordoba, especially according to the hints that the narrator made at the beginning of chapter 15 regarding the mares of the pasture of Cordoba that Sancho thought could in no way have tempted Rocinante. Finally, it seems as if we have finally reached the south of Spain, and it is full of hysterical and violent lovers.